One of Kane's more annoying idiosyncrasies, as a chronicler of events of, in his tendency to gloss over periods of time in which he feels nothing of interest to have happened from his singularly self-centered perspective, just such an Elysian now occurs. Picking up his narrative after a gap of several weeks, I have accordingly inserted the following extract, which I hope will go some way towards making up the obvious difference. From the Crusade and after, a military history of the Democritus Gulf by Virgo Royce, 058-M42. The Tower's offer of truce was regarded with a fair degree of suspicion at first, not least by Commissar Kane, to whom it had been delivered. Nevertheless, with the Imperial forces poised on the brink of annihilation, the defenders had little option but to accept it. Accordingly, when the relief flotilla arrived, accompanied by a hastily assembled diplomatic mission, and no less a patronage than the Lord General himself, they found General Braddock an uncontested control of Peak Haven, to no one's greater surprise than his own. Before long, the Quadrandilia garrison had been reinforced by the new arrivals of sufficient strength to detour all but the most determined assaults. But such a precaution securely seemed needed, as the tower remained behind the lines to which they had withdrawn immediately upon the declaration of a ceasefire. Thus it was, with a fair degree of suspicion, that negotiations began, and the tower's motives for such an unexpected move became clear. Chapter 3 They were up to something, I said, delighted to feel the deck plates of the Imperial vessel underfoot once again. The fact that it was Zaven's flagship, and therefore the most heavily armed ship in the flotilla, only added a little zest to my relief at finally making it off Quadranvilia in one piece. Of course they are, Zaven agreed. He'd met me personally as I stepped off the shuttle in the hangar bay. Much to my surprise. It was pleasant to see him again, and he seemed to feel the same about me. Although the purpose for my visit was far from social. They said nothing else since they first spoke to you. Nothing about their reasons for calling a truce, I said, raising my voice a little over the clatter of the boots on his personal guard as they were making the tottle ahead of us, clearing the corridor like a braid beckoned dozer blade. Light from the overhead luminators, ricocheted from the polished helms and hell guns, held ready for use despite the fact that we were among friends. I doubted that the captain and crew were all but happy about heavily armed guardmen waving guns about in their vessel all willy-nilly. But protocol demanded it, and I, for one, was hardly going to complain, given the number of assassination attempts Zaven had already survived. Just the usual bickering about the details. Details which Braddock and his staff had dealt with, leaving me free to seek more congenial diversions. I'm afraid I can't fill you in on those. I'm a bit behind in paperwork. How's your men, by the way? Zaven asked, as we reached the door to his personal quarters. Recovering well, I trust. I'll convey your good wishes, I told him. Jürgen was probably still soaking about being left behind, but the Medici had recommended light duties for a while, and being jolted around in a shuttle would hardly have helped his convalescence. Besides, I wanted him back in the bunker, so I'd know at once if Braddock did anything rash, like turning his newly acquired firepower on the towel while the backs were turned. Throne knew I'd be tempted in his shoes. I heard what you did, going back for him like that. Not many men would, Zaven said, leading the way to his state room while the stormtroopers took up position outside to guard the corridor. He'd have done the same for me, 
I said, truthfully enough. Evidently, the Tao diplomats had been talking to their imperial counterparts already. An other superior's tale of my gallantry was doing the rounds. I settled into a comfortably padded seat and accepted the goblet of Amsik, which Zaven Stewart had already poured for me with a nod of thanks. It never hurt to get on well with the servants, particularly in my covert advocation as Amberley's eyes and ears. I gleaned quite a few nuggets of information that way over the years, to my own benefit as well as hers. No doubt, Zaven said dryly, taking my modesty for granted, and firmly cementing the story in his mind as he did so. He accepted his own drink, and the steward bustled out, closing the door with a satisfyingly resonant thud. No chance of anything we said being overheard now. I'd like you to sit in in the initial meeting. I could do that. I agreed, readily enough. The commissariat would expect a report anyway, and if I didn't agree to be their observer, one of the other commissars attached to the task force would be handed the job. I didn't mean any, but most of the ones I've conversed with would cheerfully urge a full-scale invasion of Quadrinvidia if the Tau didn't pick up and leave a course of action which was bound to end badly. Besides, I had dealings with the Tau and the vessels before, and couldn't quite shake the feeling that something wasn't quite right about all this. When the other boot dropped, I wanted to be there to hear it. That would be most helpful, another voice put in, and I turned to find a face I recognized. Nero, Sirius, sporting a faint scar inflicted on the night. I'd rather have forgotten. Denoli. I rose to shake hands, both surprised and pleased to see the senior diplomat I'd first met on Gravelax, the same night as Amber Lee, some sixty years before. You're heading to delegation. So it seems. He smoothed a non-existent crease from the front of his immaculate robe regarding me with an air of calm deliberation, I recalled so clearly. You look surprisingly well for a man of your profession. I've been lucky, I said, with a rather more sincerity than I'm used to. And I could say the same about you. His hair was a lot grayer around the temples than I remembered. But then, so was mine. Hardly surprising, given the number of times something had tried to kill me since the last time we'd spoken. I'd like to say we've been lucky, Denoli said. If you haven't been on Quanvilia, the Tau might have decided against opening negotiations. Me, I said in honest astonishment. Oh, I'm sorry, but I don't see what I've got to do with it. Denoli settled into the seat between Zaven and myself and reached for the ganter, the decanter the servant had left on the polished obsidian table, laid siege to buy the chairs. The tower will still remember your part in resolving the Gravelax incident. He said, Do they? I asked, an uncomfortable chill for taking me. The standoff there had ended in humiliation for the Xenos, if they were still carrying a grudge about it, I would start looking over my shoulder. Indeed, they spoke very highly of your integrity and your commitment for the greater good of the Imperium. Denoli sipped at his drink. At just the right moment, to mask my facial expression, accompanying the words. So, they had every confidence that you would relay the message and get someone in authority to listen to it, Zaven added. Couldn't they have just voxed it? I asked, instead of chasing me across half the city. At that point, they had no idea it was you, the Noli said. Fortunately, the vox intercepts had made them aware of your presence somewhere among the Imperial forces, 
in the onboard cognitor of the battlesuit you intended had instructions to look for an officer who matched the facial features of an old Pict from Gravelex. I see. I said, recalling the target of beam sweeping across my face, and try not to think about how close we come to the Xenos machine spirit having nothing recognizable left to read. But voxing would it still have been easier. I'm not sure General Braddock would have listened, Zaven said dryly, and I have to concede the point. By the time I got back to the bunker, Braddock had concluded that the sudden session of the Tau bombardment was a prelude to an all-out assault, and had taken a fair amount of persuasion, not to mention shameless trading on my inflated reputation, to argue him out of sallying forth in a glorious do-or-die preemptive counter-attack, which would add previous little of the do about it, given the forces ranged against him. So, where are we supposed to be meeting, then? I asked. Peak Haven somewhere in the occupied zone? Given the choice, I've opted for the latter, as the Tau held most of the temperature areas, and I'd got heavenly sick of the bracing mountain air in the capital by now. Besides, it never hurts to get a good look at your enemy's resources while they're not shooting at you. I had fewer qualms about venturing into the stronghold of a foe than I normally would, as, by and large, the Tau can be trusted to observe the terms of a truce. They're devious little buggers, right enough, but hoisting a white flag to lure you into a ceasefire doesn't sit well with them. Neither, Denali said to my surprise. The Lord General has expressed some disquiet about the opportunities for intelligence gathering afforded by the Tau presence within our Imperial Zone, and my opposite number from the Water Crest has similar concerns, which as I'd been concerning precisely that myself, I could hardly quabble with. Well then, Zaven asked, leaning forward to pour himself a refill. One of the abandoned orbital docks, Denali said. We can secure it easily enough. It's not as though it's needed for cargo handling at the moment. Works for me, I said, assessing the pros and cons and settling instantly on the major advantage from my point of view. If the whole thing went ploin-shaped, and the war kicked off again, I'd be sitting comfortably above it for once. Me too, Zaven said. Oh, that's a navy is stationed of warship alongside. Then, we can blow the whole thing to scrap at the first sign of treachery. An idea I liked the sound of a lot less but Donoli was already nodding in agreement. The Tau have already indicated that they're taking a similar precaution. Both men look at me, and I plastered a weary grin on my face, wondering if perhaps I should find some pressing reason to palm the job off on one of my commissarial colleagues after all. But then, before the thought had time to form fully, I dismissed it. Zaven and the Tower both wanted me there, and if I pulled out, chances were the Xenos would pick up their ball and go home. We'd all start shooting at each other again, and I'd get the blame for snatching defeat from the jaws of the compromise. That should keep everyone honest, I said instead, resolving to make sure I knew where the savior pods were before anyone had a chance to open their mouths. In the event I didn't need to make sure of an escape route, as everyone was on their best behavior, although that didn't stop me from doing so anyway. By this stage in my career, finding the quickest way out of any new place I found had become second nature, which rather accounted for the fact that I was still around to be paranoid. Both warships assigned to what was ephemistatically referred to as diplomatic protection duty, was stationed several kilometers from the orbital 
due to the high conservation of debris still clustered around it. The cloud of uh, Tisteris was so dense, in fact, that nothing much larger than an aquila could approach the void station without being pounded to pieces accordingly. As we approached the huge and somewhat battered structure, our transport bobbed and weaved like a nibrit, as the pilot was forced to make constant course corrections to avoid a collision. That takes some clearing up, Jürgen commented, peering through what seemed to be under the circumstances, to be pitifully thin sheet of armor glass, like the spiraling chunks of jagged metal beyond. Many were rimmed with frost. Some were residual atmosphere had frozen around them. And I tried not to think too hard about the explosive decomposition that had undoubtedly accompanied its disposition. Finding myself morbidly wondering how many of the motes of foitum casking the light of the sun raising beyond the edge of the world below where the cadavers of those too slow to have reached the closing bulkhead doors. I nodded, hoping a little conversation would distract me. I imagine it will. I agreed. I'd been in two minds about bringing him, but was grateful by now that I had. His recovery was almost complete, and if the nagging little voice in the back of my head was right, and the tower were up to something underhand... There was no one I'd rather have watching my back. Besides, he'd been grumpy enough for being left behind with my little chat with Zavin and Donnelly. Another perceived slight would have prolonged the sulk for weeks. But at least it'll make it hard for anything to sneak up on us. Anything big, Jürgen replied, after a moment's reflection. But it'll make it really easy to slip one of those drone things through without anyone noticing. All specs will be clogged. Quite so, I said. Not best pleased to have been handed something else to fret about. Offhand, I couldn't see any reason the tower would bother to do something like that. <laughs> of course. But then I suppose that would have been the point. Can you see the void station yet? Jürgen shook his head. I thought it was on your side. Your side was my side minutes ago, I reminded him, just as a pilot talked us into another rule, this time around a larger than usual piece of junk, which looked as though it had once been a pressure vessel from a fabricationy or possibly a storage tank for liquids of some kind. Either way, it was longer than our aquila, and eclipsed the sun for a moment. When the light returned, it was from a new and unexpected angle, dazzling me, as I blinked my eyes clear. The orbital finally came into view. I'd seen plenty of smaller, similar structures for over the years, of course, although since our crippled starship had glanced off the anchorage above Neskewn Fundamentalis in its headlong plunge into the surface. The sight of one always brought it with a momentary surge of unease. I waited for the unwelcome sensation to pass off as usually it did, but the sense of disquiet refused to leave me, and after a while I realized it wasn't going to. Not until I had a much better idea what was going on, anyways. Bit of a mess, Jürgen said, unconscious as always, of the irony. But on this occasion, I had to concede that he had a point. The tower had attempted to board the orbital during the first wave of their initial attack, hoping to deny the SDF the chance to resupply and refit here, but had underestimated the defenders' resolve, vastly outgunned and faced with certain annihilation, the captain of the last surviving gunboat rammed the primary docking arm, reducing both it and his vessel to high-velocity shrapnel, and taking a respectable tally of Tau Mantas with him. The resulting mess had formed both sides to abandon the structure, although I gathered that the Tau 
have been making diligent efforts to repair it. Prior to the unexpected offer of a ceasefire. As our shuttle drifted closer, the full magnitude of the damage the void station had suffered became progressively clearer. What had appeared from a distance to be nothing more than major blemishes on the hull gradually grew, revealing themselves to be vast chasms torn or burned through the seething metal, or blown out by initial detonations. Through those jagged rents, the equally ragged edges of interior decks could be seen, the damage doing deeper than all running lights could penetrate. Uncomfortably, firefly sparks moving in and around these stricken areas puzzled me for a moment, until we approached the small lighted region on the edge of the city-sized structure where warmth and air awaited us. One drifted close enough for me to recognize it. It was a smooth-sided drone, of the kind I had become all too familiar with on the battlefield although this particular specimen was equipped with a welding torch instead of an armament. It floated past the viewport, followed a moment later by a couple more carrying girders and flat sheets of construction material in articulated manipulator, manipulator arms. That must be where we're going, I concluded a few moments later. Spots of the bay door creaking open to admit our approaching Aquila. The habitational zone stood out clearly now, and had to discern a few details even from this distance. The warm golden lights blazing from the viewports, and the docking bays standing in stark and picnic contrast to the dark, dead bulk of the station to which it clung, welcoming as it looked. I felt a shiver of apprehension. Smooth, curving, tile-constructed surfaces clung to the solid imperial structure beneath like fungus to a decaying tree trunk. Where the Xenos had repaired and replaced the original architecture, tainting it with their inhuman presence. Clearly they intended to stay, claiming the entire orbital for their own, before whatever it was they were concerned about had prompted them to sue for peace on the very threshold of victory. There's little time for such dispiriting reflection, however. As before long we were on the final approach, the great portal loomed up to swallow our tiny shuttle. The hangar beyond was absurdly large for a modest of vessel having been intended for heavy lift shuttles capable of lugging a titan around and able to accommodate several at once to boot. So the Aquila seemed dwarfed by the cavernous space surrounding us. A few moments later the hull reverberated to the clang of our landing gear, making contact with the deck, and the whine of our engines died away. So great a volume took several minutes to pressurize. I spent the time gazing at the surroundings as best as I could through the haze of frost, which formed instantly across the viewport, as the thickening atmosphere met a hole, chilled to near absolute zero by the vacuum of space. The tower renovations didn't seem to have spared us as the interior of this particular hangar, and I took heart from the familiar sturdy greater work surrounding us. The oppressive sense of wrongness I felt at all those smooth curves clinging to the surface of the stations receding a little. There was even an imperial aquila dominating the far wall, it spreading its wings, poised to unfold the vast chamber in the protection of the emperor. About a dozen other shuttles stood in seared ranks nearby, the imperial ones close to their own while the unmistakable rounded holes of their Tau counterparts were stationed on the opposite side, ironically appearing to receive the benediction of the Imperial Icon behind them, though the 
gradually melding rhyme, obscuring the viewport, I could see movement, which at first I ascribed to vacuum-hardened servitors tending the air pumps, or perhaps uh, simply wandering vaguely in search of the cargoes they used to lug about. But as the temperature rose and the armor glass cleared, the true nature became apparent. Void-suited guardsmen, their heraldry and hell guns they carried, making them out as members of Zaven's retinue. The Lord General must be here already, I remarked, confirming my guess almost at once as I caught sight of his personal shuttle, half hidden behind an adjacent Avis. And Jaeger nodded. And he didn't trust the Zenos any more than we do, he added, with every sign of approval. I think that's mutual, I said, catching a glimpse of similar movement among the Xeno shuttles across the wide espance of clear decking between us. They've got posted guards, too. The armored figures seemed unusually squat for Tao. In the moment of further observing, observation revealed the reason. Denenberg, by the look of them, which finally confirmed the long-standing rumor of a contingent of the blocky Zenos accompanying the Tau fleet. Doesn't matter who they are, Jürgen said, reducing the political complexities to the most basic as readily as he usually did. If they get in the way, they're crude fodder. Quite so, I said, hoping it would turn out to be that easy. Then the hiss of the pressure seal breaking informed me that the atmosphere was now dense enough to breathe, and that it was time to disembark. I adjusted the angle of my cap to one. I hoped my reception party would consider appropriately heroic, and began to descend the ramp. Chapter 4 Outside the confines of the shuttle, the hangar seemed bigger than ever. A black metal plane stretched into the distance for roughly a kilometer, unrivaled by anything other than the occasional protruding fuel line or deactivated loader. The residue of chill, which had seeped in along with the vacuum accompanying our arrival, hardly made the place seem any more welcoming. Although Jürgen seemed happy enough with being able to see every breath he exhaled. After exchanging salutes and a few words with the guardsmen we had observed through the Aquila's viewport, my aide and I began to trudge towards the hatchway they indicated, leaving them and their opposite numbers to glower at one another across the echoing void. Even though I knew there was little risk of active hostilities breaking out before we reached it, the veteran stormtroopers assigned as Zavin's personal guard, being far too disciplined to start anything, I must confess to a feeling of distinct sense of relief as we approached the airlock set into the wall ahead of us. The Dimmerug could be touchy, especially if the Tau weren't around to keep an eye on them, and standing around in the open made me feel dangerously exposed even at the best of times. The temperature rose to more comfortable levels almost as soon as the hangar-side door thudded close behind us, which improved my mood to no end. Although my renewed equanimity lasted no longer than the time it took for the further door to open. Instead of the solid metal bulkheads I'd been expecting, the walls of the corridor beyond were of smooth blue-white polymer, reflecting the pale ruthogans of the Tau illuminators. Clearly this part of the station was firmly in enemy hands. Commissar Kane, a young woman in pale grey kirtle, was waiting for me, in elaborately braided scaplock, reaching halfway down her back. If anything, her appearance had been more disconcerting than the decor. The other delegates are waiting for you in the conference shuttle. Her gothic was flawless, though marred by the 
peculiar lisp, which the Tao inflected it. Then I must apologize for my tardiness, I replied, masking my discomfiture with the greatest of ease. If nothing else, I had plenty of practice of doing that over the years. In truth, though, I was profoundly shaken. I had known intellectually, of course, that the Tao had annexed a number of human worlds in the last couple of centuries, and their inhabitants had embraced their insidious creed of the so-called greater good. But I never thought to meet one of the heretics in the flesh, unless it was the business end of a chainsword. No apology is required, the woman said with a courteous inclination of her head. She was damn good at her job, and I had to give her that. She hadn't even blinked at her first sign at Jürgen. Please, follow me. With pleasure, I assured her, with rather more gallantry than accuracy as I fell into step with her at elbow, with a towel hoping to put us at our ease by her presence, or was it supposed to rattle us, leaving us more inclined to make an error? Either way, I was damned if I was going to give the satisfaction of reacting in any way other than the appearance of perfect calm. May I present my aide, Gunnar Jürgen? Of course, she nodded at him, as though I just introduced an item of furniture. Please to make your acquaintance. And you are? I asked, convinced now that she was as practice a dissembler as I was. Alois Devia. Particulator of external regulations. Tau personal name in Pedro family one? I said. Interesting combination. Quite common where I come from, she assured me, with a smile most men would have taken for genuine. A blend of both to remind us of the greater good. And where would that be? I asked, trying not to sound as though I meant to earmark it for various bombing. Clearly her home world was well past due for liberating, although whether the population were heresy and taken such firm root could never be guided back to the light of the Emperor seemed a moot point to me. Kileath, she said before, apprehending the name meant nothing to me. Our ancestors called it Downholm, she added helpfully. Still didn't ring any bells, I admitted. While we'd been talking, we'd progressed deep into the heart of the station, fighting the same pitchwork of Tau and Imperial systems wherever we went. Which I suppose applied to Alias too. It's a big empire, she said, failing to take off it and provoking the first genuine smile from me. But I suppose most of its citizens must have been arrogant of how small and insignificant the Tau holdings were compared to the scale of the Imperium, or they would never have dared to challenge us in the first place. Just through here, she gestured to a doorway no different to my eyes than any of the others we'd passed. Apart from some inscription in the blocky, rounded sigils of the Tau alphabet. You're not joining us for the briefing, I asked as the woman shook her head. I'm no warrior, she told me, with a faint hint of amusement. I happen to be on my way up here, so I offered to escort you. For the greater good, I said dryly, but she only nodded either missing the sarcasm or choosing to ignore it. In a small way, she agreed. But I was also curious to meet some of our kindred from beyond the Empire. There are stories, of course, but you never really know how true they are. 
Then, I hope we lived up to your expectations, I said, doing my best to hide my amusement. You certainly did, she assured me, though for some reason she seemed to be looking at Jürgen as she spoke. Then she ambled away down the corridor without so much as a backward glance. Heretic, Jürgen muttered. The minute she was out of earshot, fingering the butt of his lasgun as though tempted to use it. Quite. I agreed, envying him in his uncomplicated response to things. The encounter had disconcerted me more than little, and I still couldn't shake the conviction that had been precisely the point. I took a deep breath, adjusted my face, and approached the door, alias had indicated, had indicated. Come on, let's find out what's all this about. Our Luis had called the room a comfort suite, but it was like none I'd ever seen before. There are aspects of it I recognized, of course, like the softly glowing hollow of display suspended in the air, but the image inside it was crystal sharp, instead of wavering like the ones I'm used to. And the edges formed a perfect sphere, instead of hazing away in a decisive blob. It took me a moment to pick out the projection unit from among the other machina r ranged about the room, as there was no sign of the tendril of power cables and optical links I would have expected nor any of the tech priest ministering to it. The hololiths I was used to needed constant adjustment, annotating and the occasional divisional kick to remain focused. It also didn't help that everything looked the same. Flat, glossy surfaces mounted at an angle in rounded lecterns with glowing runes appearing and disappearing on them pretty much at random. The bigger surprise was the absence of a table which would have formed the focal point of any imperial conference chamber. Instead, it seemed we were expected to perch on round padded seats, which were scattered across the carpet like fungus erupting from the lawn. About a dozen of these were occupied by roughly equal numbers of humans and Tau, with about half as many again left vacant while the humans I could see sitting or standing around perversively, the periphery wore imperial garb, so I assumed any other turncoats among the Xenos contingent were being kept tactfully out of sight, leaving Jürgen to join Zaven's bodyguard and investigate the refreshment table on my behalf. I claimed a seat between Denoli and the Lord General, who smiled at my attempt to perch on the blasted thing without slithering off. They're comfortable enough once you get used to them, Zaven assured me, before wobbling a bit himself and glancing scarlet at Denoli. So I'm told. The department, of course, looked... The diplomat, of course, looked perfectly at ease, but since he spent half his time... Lizzing with a towel, he'd had plenty of time to get used to their particular taste in furnishings. He inclined his head in a greeting. Kamaza, we were beginning to think you'd got lost. I had an excellent guide, I assured him. Alias Devia. I take it you met? All paths have crossed, Denoli said bluntly and he never thought to mention they were human traitors among the invasion fleet. I asked, perhaps a little more bluntly than was polite. This was evidently news to Zaven, and his eyebrows rose quizzically, and he gazed at the diplomat in a fashion most men would have found intimidating, to say the least. She isn't attached to the fleet. She isn't attached to the fleet, Denoli explained. I gather there are humans under arms among the Empire's forces, just as there are Vespid, Crute, and others. 
but they wouldn't be deployed against the Imperium. They fear the resulting bad feeling would impede efforts and find a diplomatic solution here. Would impede efforts to find diplomatic solution here. To say the least, I agreed. The abhorrence most godsmen felt for traitors and heretics would make it about impossible to rein them in. But there are humans here. Zavin persisted. Dinoli nodded. They call themselves Felicitators. Not the exact translation of the Tau precise. Kyotian Voskla. But close enough. They move in after a world's been annexed, helping what's left the local authorities to rebuild the infrastructure and nudging everything towards promoting the idea of the greater good. So De Vere's already here. The Tau must have thought Quadronvilia was in the bag. I concluded. Wrapped up and ready to be handed to the ethereals. Denoli confirmed. Which rather begs the question of why they changed their minds. Zaven said. Looks like we're about to find out. I said as a flurry of activity near the door caught my attention. It towered an ornately decorated robe. Its intricate interweenings of multicolored thread no doubt an indication of his status. For those able to decode them, was just entering the room surrounded by a retinue of lackeys thick enough to obscure most of him from the view. Many of them clutched thin, flat devices I assumed to be data slates, and all glanced in our direction with varying degrees of curiosity, apprehension, and disdain. None of them had anything which looked like a weapon, but I knew better than to take that at face value. Our host has arrived. Dinoli nodded. Someone senior from the Watercrest. Not sure who, but a fast courier boat arrived in system last night. I'm told they brought the latest information with them. But not, I presume... What the information is, Zivin said sourly. Denoli shook his head. The Watercrest like to keep the cards in their hands hidden for as long as they can, he said. I turned, leaning as far as I dared on my precacious seat, trying to get a better view of the half hidden diplomat. But just as his face was about to emerge from the scrum, the familiar figure, an odor of Jürgen, loomed up in front of me, blotting out what little I could see of the approaching delegation. They've got Tanner, sir, he said, in a pleased surprise. Had me a uh, delicately worked tea bowl brimming with a fragrant infusion. For what of anything better to do, I took it and sipped, savoring the delicate flavor of the drink. I remembered your fondness for that particular beverage, a tall voice told me, and I rose to my feet, extending a hand in greeting. If I'm honest, I haven't recognized the sound of it, all tall vocal cords mangling gothic in pretty much the same way to my ears. But I never forgot a face that nearly got me killed. Ilhasi! I said, the sixty years since I had last seen the Tau diplomat falling away like so many days, the moment I got a clear sight of him. No doubt one of his own kind would have detected signs of aging. Throne knows I acquired more than my own share, but he looked pretty much the same to me. I'm pleased to see you as well. And I you, Rhasi responded potently shaking the preferred hand just gingerly enough to let me know he hadn't forgotten the augmented fingers lurking beneath my glove, before turning to Denoli. Masters, I've been far too long a long time. It has indeed, Denoli said lively, although I'd wager he was as surprised as I was to be greeted by an 
old sparring partner from Grevelex. Lord General, the Lassie went on, not missing a beat. A great pleasure to meet you at last. No doubt. Zeven inclined his head courteously, his impotence manifest. I look forward to hearing what you have to say. Like me, he spent many years cultivating a bluff, no-nonsense public face, with robbed, which robbed his bluntness of any implied offense, or at least it would have to any imperial citizen, familiar with his reputation. No point in leaving anything to chance, so I stuck in my oar as well, diverting the Tao's attention as quickly as possible in case that aspect of the Lord General's personality had somehow been omitted from the briefing slate. I must confess, I'm curious too, I said, sipping the tanner again, with a fine show of appreciation for our host's thoughtfulness. Especially since you wrote me in as your messenger boy. Hardly that. Glassy assured me, although I wasn't fluent enough in Tao body language to tell if I had been patronizing or not. From what I remembered of him, his good opinion of me is genuine enough. I'd save his life, so it damn well ought to have been though I gave him the benefit of the doubt. But your presence was a fortunate coincidence we were happy to take advantage of. Any time, I assured him, adding, but I still think they could have picked up the bloody Vox. Sato voice to Zaven and Denoli, as a Tao diplomat wandered away towards the Hololith. Neither had time to reply, although Donnelly made an interesting choking noise in the depths of his goblet. Thank you for your attendance, Arasi said, turning to face the room, his voice cutting easily across it. The murmur of conversation died away to an expected silence, broken only by the faint humming of the circulators and rather less faint sound of Jürgen's jaw making soft shifting of the finger food on the side table. No doubt our offer of a truce had been the cause of a fair amount of speculation, at which point he glanced at the direction of the imperial congenient in a manner which, in a human, I could only describe as arched. But I am sure you will agree it for our reasons. For... It are sound. They might have even got around to telling us what they were, Zivin muttered. Then his expression changed as an image appeared in the hololith. Emperor Almighty and all his saints, I added. Feelingly, the image was crystal clear, almost as though the horror it depicted was present in the room with us although it had been the chamber which would have needed to be bigger than the entire orbital. Luperus hide. Luperus hide thicker than the armor of a battleship pocked with infectual weapon fire loomed up at us over the depths of space, spinning below our vantage point like a biological moon. Beyond the horizon of Chiton, other massive creatures of the same monstrous ilk swam through the void surrounded by clouds of lesser organisms too numerous to count. A tyrannid fleet, Zivin said, raising his voice to address the room, although the sudden eruption of gas murmurs and muttered prayers to the Emperor among the Imperial delegation made it abundantly clear that we all recognized it for what it was. He indicated the larger bioships. Kraken and escorts. Mostly, Elhasi said in remarkably even tones. The large one in the foreground would appear to be Leviathan, although the image we have of it's only partial. I stared at it, trying to take in the full scale of the horror before me. 
like a mountain made flesh or given its environment, an, an asteroid might be more of a apparent comparison. My mind flashed back to the burning, dying thing I had glimpsed in the midst of the eruption on the Skuin Fundamentalist, where we'd been forced to sacrifice an entire city to kill a crippled cousin of this monstrous thing that had seemed huge enough, and I'd seen only a fraction of its mass. Where did this come from? I asked, realizing as soon as I'd spoken just how many so imprecise a question could be misinterpreted. But Olasi seemed to grasp the meaning well enough. This is the last transmission from an exploration vessel, Loss, in the core words, Marcus, a little less than two cry ago, about eighteen months. Denali murmured for the benefit of those as unfamiliar with the Tau calendar. Twenty, at most. And you've only just got it? I asked, trying not to sound too spectacle. Olhassen nodded, a gesture he seemed to have picked up from his prolonged contact with humans. I remembered him doing the same thing on Gravelax. The vessel launched a carrier drone shortly before it was destroyed, he said. The images you're seeing now were uploaded to in real time. I watched with horrified fascination as innumerable tiny pussyrits swelled up on the body of the bloated horror beneath us, then burst spewing clouds of spinning organisms into the void, thousands upon thousands of them, their hardened carapaces protecting them from the cold and vacuum of space, fangs and talons and bioweapons poised for the measure. I had faced innumerable horrors spawned from the Tyranid high fleets myself, but never anything so hideous as these half-warrior, half-boarding pod, all implacable killing machines. Some were carrying creatures I recognized, gene-stealers, termagons, and ravengers, for the most part, encrusted beyond semi-transparent membranes while others seem to be more than sufficiently lethal on their own accounts. Why don't they just fire the main engines? I asked. If I'd been the Tau captain, I'd halfway to the ghoul stars by now. According to the telemathery recovered, the engines were at full power by this point, Alhassi said soberly. We conjecture that the vessel had been... Immobilized in some fashion. The stress on the hull would be consistent with constricting tentacles or grappling claws. Zaven nodded. Seen that a few times. He agreed. They ram a ship, latch on and send in the killers. The onrushing swarm was filling the holodeath by now, each detail more ghastly than the last and I must confess to a feeling of relief, as the image finally disappeared in a burst of static. At this point, Alhasi said evenly, we believe the main reactor overloaded, although there is no way to tell if this was deliberate or how much damage the explosion inflicted on Leviathan. We may hope that it was significant, to kill or cripple the half ship, but in any way or event, many of the swarm will have survived and become aware of the presence of prey. Zaven said, "Precisely," Arhasi agreed. He did something to the projection controls, and a fresh image appeared. A star map studded with familiar constellations. Little icons popped up, marking Imperial, Tau, and Unclaimed Worlds, although it went without saying that their data of these categories didn't entirely concede with ours. This was hardly the time to reopen old quarrels, though so I refrained from saying anything, although I was pretty sure I could hear Zaven's teeth grinding. The message drone was recovered here, 
a fresh icon appeared way within the borders of the Tao Empire. Las Kirarota, about two months back, Danoni muttered quietly. Ahasi continued speaking as if unaware of the comment. And our primary analysis of the data places an encounter with a tyranny fleet somewhere around here, he concluded. Another icon appeared. Zavin shook his head perplexedly. That can't be right, he said. The main Tyranid instructions were coming from the rim. They have done until now, I said, my eye falling on the marker pinpointing the skewed fundamentalists. The dormant brood we discovered there had to have some come from somewhere. And the fleet the Tau had blundered into certainly seemed close enough to have sent out a scouting party several millennia ago. But it wouldn't be the first time an isolated splinter fleet popped up without warning. Our experience also, Elasi agreed. In view of evident risk, we scant scout vessels to backtrack the message drone and found that the Tyranids have indeed altered their course. A line began to extend to the point where the luckless explorator crew, explorator crew had first encountered the high fleet, towards the position of the drone's recovery. They followed it. I said heavily, the coin dropping, which is hardly surprising. The Tau had done pretty much everything they could to attract the needs, short of handing them a menu on a map. They did, Arhasi confirmed, another icon flared. The scout fleet encountered them here, and engaged a few of the outlying bioships before being forced to withdraw. If they continue to advance at the rate they have been, They'll be into the border region in a matter of weeks. The line extended itself, cutting back and forth across the wavering zone. Across the wavering one between two powers. That puts over a dozen inhabited worlds at risk, Zaven said in a tone of a man determined to get all the bad news out of the way in one go. If the fleet absorbs this much biomass, they'll become unstoppable. Which is why we propose putting aside our present dispute, Orhasi said, nodding gravely. The greater good demands it. Zaven was nodding too, still trying to absorb the implications. I believe it does. He agreed. All right, that's going to do it for this <sighs> video. <sighs> oh, I'm sorry it took a long time to uh, get this video out. A lot of stuff has been going on, including finishing up the touches in my room that are needed for recording and everything else, which is why I was able to get the other two videos out last week, or the week before, prior. In a perfect manner, along with work searching, which appears to be stupidly hard, as um, everything in the area and everyone in the surrounding area for miles has help wanted signs, but don't actually re require help. For they are not hiring, but they want workers, but they're not hiring. Anyways, let us say thank you to our ongoing Patreon supporters. Let's say thank you to Coke Koa, Zach Killer Coffee, Meltdown 480, Eldrick Maldred, Fortis Unam, Doskovsky Was Right, and Lalek NPC. Thank you all for being ongoing Patreon support members. If you want to be part of the Patreon club, join the Discord and have fun with us playing Jackbox, see art and a whole bunch of other stuff, including talk with us on political matters, not safe for work stuff, and other things, you can in the Patreon. 
which will be happening sometime soon this week. Actually, I'll be activating the Patreon for anyone else that's part of the of the year. Uh, I'll be activating the Discord for anyone in the Patreon later this week. Uh, let's give it till at least let's say Wednesday next week. Anyways. Tell me what you think might be happening in the story, unless you actually read it, so don't tell me what actually happens. Because I want to find out for myself, along with everyone else that's a very good listener, if I do say so myself. How has your day been? What's been going on in your life? You've heard enough about mine, let's hear about yours. Anything new? Any new projects? Anything happening at work that is of concerning matters, or... Things that are great, good news. I want to see nothing but good news in the comment section about things that you're working on, things in your life, and this therefore and so forth. Anyways, I've been me, you've been you, and thank you for watching another one of these videos. I hope to see you in the next one, lads. Until then, stay safe out there and have yourselves a good one. Goodbye.